Welcome to the Leo Training Podcast with Joe DeLeo. You'll hear in-depth interviews and tips from world-class athletes, coaches, and industry-leading experts to help you train smarter and improve at what you love to do. Train smarter, get stronger, move better, race faster. Here's your host, Joe DeLeo. We're back with episode 75 of the Leo Training Podcast. And this week, I have a fantastic treat for you. We're going to be turning back time and looking at some of the ancient restorative training tools, such as the Indian Club, the Persian Meal, the Indian Jury, and the God of Mace. I sit down with Paul Taras Volkovinsky. And we discuss each of these different tools and pieces of the equipment. Now, Paul has spent years extensively researching, reading, and learning from old books and manuals, as well as extensively traveling the globe to learn about each of these pieces of the equipment. So some of the things that we're going to cover in respect to each piece of equipment is their history, um, how to pick out uh proper equipment. So some of the characteristics you should be looking for if you're interested in purchasing or making uh, your own tools uh, to make sure the weight distribution is right. Um, And this is going to play a major factor into the benefit and the training effect that you're going to get from using these tools. And then finally, we'll also just talk about uh, training um, in general uh, and some of the benefits uh, that this has for Uh, restorative purposes as well as overall health. So without further ado, let's roll to episode 75 with Paul Taras Volkovinsky, Restorative Training. I am very excited uh, for this evening's guest on the Leo Training Podcast. Uh, I have with me um, tuning in and uh, coming in live from Australia, Paul Taras Volkovinsky. Paul, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on. Uh, Leo, that's very happy to be here. Thanks. Yes, my pleasure. Um, you've got such a breadth of knowledge um, in some of the, the sort of ancient disciplines um, that uh, are, are being reignited and, and becoming popular again at, at this point in the world. Um it's, it's, I'm very much looking forward to uh, this conversation with you and, and learning more about all of these uh, different modalities. Um, so before we get into that, why don't we start with who you are, uh, where you're located in the world, um, and uh, your, your background? Sure. No, okay, let's, so let's go. So my name is Paul Taras Volkovinsky of um, Polish-Russian descent, but living in um, Perth, Western Australia. And to start, basically, I, I mean, I've been uh, doing physical stuff most of my life, but, like, but it was more sort of running when I was younger, then swimming, and then doing a lot of walking. But as the years crept by, I put on quite a bit of weight, and by the time I got to about 57, I was about 30 k overweight, and um, doctors were telling me, you know, mate, do something about it, because it's, um, you're going to get out of shape very, very quickly. And um, with being having been told that, I started looking around for something to do. And this was about 2006, and I found Pavel's Enter the Kettlebell. And that started me off on my sort of weight loss journey and it's sort of getting sort of very, very fit over a, a sort of a few years. It wasn't a sort of like a one-night wonder, obviously. It was a, a few years but the, um, that book was basically a major sort of um, discovery for me, and the discipline that Pavel put into that was just fantastic. And I started with kettlebells. I mean, basically, that's what I did. I, you know, there was um, kettlebell swinging, and I just followed the book page by page and just absolutely loved it. And then I realized that one of the things that I'd, I'd never really done before was I, I loved the actual swinging action of the kettlebell. And that got me to searching, you know, what else, what I was going to swing, um, found Scott Sonnen and his um, club bells, got a set of them in, which I'll talk about later on. And also a mace at that stage it was very early on, sort of about 2007, I got my first mace. 
And um, again, I was again day on a daily basis swinging kettlebells, and I love the long cycle. So I was trying to sort of you know went from sort of double sixteens to twenties, twenty fours, and a little bit of twenty eights, but not much more than that. But then the the mace was sort of you know standing in the corner, grizzling at me, and I, I um, sort of tried a few times to swing it with and failed miserably because I had no idea basically how to. Okay, I could drop it over my shoulder onto one side, but I couldn't understand how to get it up on the other side. And there was nothing. There was nothing on the internet about it in those days. Um, and my son and I were training together, and we worked out a method of um, just helping each other with the mace. By, um, for instance, if I was swinging the mace over my right shoulder, my son would stand on my left side and catch the head as it was going up and just help push it up over, 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 overhead again. So you'd stood still with it in the middle. But we were still, both of us were making one major mistake with the mace, and that's we were swinging it with our um, hands sort of too high um, behind the head. And the hands have to go really low um, so that you, so that basically the palm is on the nape of the neck and the, the mace swings from the elbow. And I'll, I'll talk about a little bit more about that in a minute. The um, so basically we kept getting hurt. We, I mean, you, you know, you'd swing the mace a few times. We'd swing it five times to the left, five times to the right, and walk away with sore elbows. And then basically, you know, your body's telling you don't do this anymore because your elbows are sore. And um, we'd leave it two or three weeks, start again, to hurt ourselves again. And it took a while for the penny to drop that you really had to get that sort of, you know, the, the triceps extension and the, the, the hand right behind the nape of the neck to make this mace swing properly. And the minute we realized that that was, um, that was the, the thing to do, mace swing just literally took off. I mean, it was just, you know, we were, we were struggling to do five swings each side and then suddenly we were up to 20 and 30 and then, then we were, um, you know, with the sort of disciplines that Pavel was talking about in his book, um, you know, do five one way, five the other way, um, or, or sort of swinging out and say cleaning and pressing. Then we went, we converted that, uh, the count of five to five minutes. So, you know, can we swing the mace for five minutes nonstop and so on? So, I mean, it just built up from there. And we were still doing kettlebells at the same time. So this was all happening. And I was happily losing weight, which I was very happy about. And um, then I found Indian clubs on the internet. And it was a book written by Cobb and Jenkin in 1905. And it had plans of Indian clubs in the book, which is still available to this day on the internet. And I've got a link to it on my website. And I thought, yeah, you beauty. Well, let's let's get these clubs made up. So I found a um, a wood turner here in Perth, and he was an old boy, 82 years old. And I went to see him and asked him if he could make them. And you know, within a few weeks, I had the, all, all four all four. And um, there were four clubs in the book, and I had a, 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 foot, a pair of each um, club made up from the book. Fantastic. Um, some of them were very heavy. Sorry. I said fantastic. Yeah. So some of them are pretty heavy, but I, I was most interested in the, the, the lighter ones. So the, the, and the, the lighter ones were 26 inches long and they weighed 1.25 kilos, which is about two and a half pounds. And um, now I'm going to jump back a bit. At the same time, I'd already bought a set of club bells and I tried to swing them and we tried to do swipes with my, my son and I tried to do swipes with them and we were doing okay. We we're, were sort of working up to sort of, you know, two eight kilo um, club bells on each side, swinging them over our head, bringing them down on, on, on a sagittal format, either side of the body. And um, I have to sort of stop the sort of training thing for a minute. One, one of the funniest things that I thought was I was comfortably, by this time, comfortably lifting, double lifting two 20 kilo kettlebells. And yeah, and I bought two 20 kilo club bells. And when I first got them in, I remember unpacking the box and lifting one of these things up. And I very quickly realized that there was no way that I could actually hold one of the club bells of that weight and still and control it in my wrist because I didn't know really how what to do with them at that stage. But I was just shocked at the comparative ease I had of lifting a kettlebell and the difficulty of lifting the same weight in a club bell. 
So that was just, it's just a sort of it's a strange thing. But then I, I swung the club bells for a bit and tried to get some of the Indian club movements um, sorted out that I'd read out of books. And um, I couldn't, just couldn't get my head around it for some reason. And I, and I admit, I was trying to do an Indian club movement with a club bell. And I first ones I tried was a, um, a four kilo. Then I dropped down to a two kilo, which had a really thin handle. It was very hard to go, grab hold of. And it just wasn't working. When my Indian clubs came in, you suddenly go from sort of a, 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 um, a two kilo, maybe 14 inch club bell to 26 inches and um, two and a half pounds. And suddenly there's this massive pull that the club makes and it swings through. So you can, you know, you, the, the difference was just astounding. I, I can't even begin to describe the, the, it was almost like a shock. You know, well, well, this is why these things are so long because you've got the weight a long way away from your wrist. Gravity takes over, pulls the club down, and then you've got to you've got to um, captivate that sort of energy and bring it up on the other side and bring it up over your head and then into whatever circle that you do. Um, so yeah, so that was the beginnings, and then slow. Then um, as time went on, I um, I mean, okay, I'm going to say I'm 67. And I, I discovered a problem with kettlebells that I don't know if anybody else has had, um, but I had to stop using them. And here's the reason why. I started getting back pain, and I thought it was basically my technique that was failing, and I was doing something wrong. Um, and I went quite a few times to the doctor, and the doctor um, said, yes, it's specifically something that you're doing during your training. Um, and had a bit of back manipulation and so on. And then one day I noticed um, particularly bad back pain, and I noticed that one of my testicles had retracted into my body. And I went to the doctor the same day, and he said, oh, okay, there's, there's, something, there's, there's a problem here, something, one of your lifts or something that you're doing is a problem. Um, and I stopped basically everything. So, And then it was a process of elimination. Is it the kettlebells? Is it the Indian clubs? Is it the club bells? And so we worked through it. And it turned out that after seven years of kettlebell work every day, basically, um, I started getting what are called testicle retractions and basically had to stop using them, which is, you know, I was gutted about because I really love love kettlebells and, and, you know, always will, always will. But I just had to stop doing it. It got to the point where I did a three months break. And I thought, well, I can, and I thought, I'll just try it. And I picked up, a, I set up a, um, just one 12 kilo kettlebell in front of me, ready to swing. And literally, as it came off the floor, I could feel that there was something in my groin that was basically, you know, not right. So it just affected the way that I, I mean, had to train. I had to basically stop kettlebells, and I've since sold them, and that's gone, unfortunately. Um, club bells went kind of the same way. Um, because I just didn't like them very much. I just, I mean, I, love, I think they're great for sort of leverage work that people use. And I mean, I mean, I'm not knocking them in any way, but I mean, they just weren't for me. I mean, I just th decided that I prefer the wooden um, style of clubs much more. And by that time, I was sort of discovering the Persian meal, um, the jewelry in India, because I'd started traveling by this time. And, and um, the traveling that I was doing started because of my YouTube channel. And at one stage, the first um, trip that I did, I wanted to go and meet up with guys who'd commented on my YouTube channel. And I thought, well, we'll go and share ideas and learn and so on from each other. And I mean, I went to the States, um, met up with Rick Brown, another um, guy on the East Coast, Izzy Barish was a great, um, you know, that was a meetup. Then I went to the UK, we did some workshops and so on. I went to um, Denmark, Poland, and um, that sort of slowly the sort of workshops that I, I do um, started and they grew from there. And um, then basically at the end of the trip, it was go to India um, and basically just for observation first, making videos and trying to pick up as much information uh, from them as I could. A, a lot of it was through observation, but they also you um, because the language is a problem. So even though you've got a good translator, sometimes you miss um, bits out. So it was a lot of observation and watching them. And and I used to go get up really early in the mornings, go to the um, Akhara or the wrestler's gym and literally sit and watch them train and just observe, observe, and observe, make videos of it. 
and then then really try it out myself. You know, does this work? Does this work? And so on. And I just love the way that they um, the the way that those guys walked into the gyms there before they da- they go to their daily job. They would go into the w- gym and train, and they um, each gym is directed um, dedicated to Hanuman, the god of strength in India. So they, they, there's an altar in each um, gym, and each guy as he comes in says um, a little prayer, and basically off off he goes training. And I did the same in Iran or Persia. I mean, I went, I wanted to go there and, and learn from those guys. That was a little bit easier over there because their English is a lot better. And um, again, through translators, I spent um, two trips there, um, one traveling around um, as many Zulkane, um as uh, as I could. And then um, the second time I went, I just literally went to learn and train for a week in, in um, the south of Iran in um, a city called Shiraz which is amazing. And then that sort of kind of brings me up to today now. So, I mean, basically, I've, I've got rid of all the steel clubs um, and work purely with um, Indian, wooden Indian clubs and um, wooden meals or Persian meals. And then I'm a great fan, um, although that's just fairly recent, of the, um, the homemade mace or gada um, which doesn't have any weight in the handle, and it, it, the whole weight is concentrated on the um, the concrete ball at the end of the um, the mace. Wow, yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah, so you you spent some some time on the road traveling and uh, and going to uh, I guess the best way to say is the source the sources and uh, learning firsthand. Yes, that's that's exactly right. I mean, the um, one actually one thing I forgot to say was I also um, obviously made quite a few friends um, via the internet, and um, I, I had I was um, managed to get in and see some private collections of Indian clubs, and one in particular um, where um, the um, the owner has some very very old ancient clubs, and he, he gave me two things. He allowed me to swing them, which was which was amazing, you know. So it was like you know walking into somewhere where it, it's like a museum, and you walk into a museum and you you be, you're being handed a pair of clubs made in the 1860, and you can actually physically swing them, which is fantastic. That's so cool. And um, yeah, and no, it's just so cool. And that that uh, that particular visit allowed me to um, he allowed me to take measurements from this particular club. And it's called it's called a two pound kiho. Um, Simdi Kiho was a um, you know a, um, a seller of um, physical education and sorry training equipment in the states around about the sort of eighteen sixties. We'll talk a bit more about him later on. But these clubs, um, the dynamics of them are just extraordinary. And um, I've swung, as you can imagine, a lot of clubs, and I've tried a lot of clubs out. And these, um, even though they're so old, to my way of thinking, it's still some of the best clubs I've ever come across. So, yeah, no, it's really interesting. That's, that's very interesting. So what, what in the uh, craftsmanship of, of those clubs um, is different, uh, I guess, than, than what you've seen out there today? Okay, no, well, okay, the... the um, there's a lot to talk about the actual design of Indian clubs, and um, you've got you've got first of all it's the overall length of clubs, and then it's the weight and also the type of wood that they're made from. And um, we both, um, the the collector and I both think that the keyhose were made from a, a maple, but we're not 100% on that. And they specifically weighed um, two pounds. Now I've I've reproduced them here in West Australia out of a, um, a local wood here um, called Jarrah, and they they come the same size club comes in at two and a half pounds, and yet yeah, yeah I've used and made them out of oak also, and they come up specifically as as two pounds because the the wood density is different. Oh. But the aero the aerodynamics the aerodynamics of the club are just amazing. Um, now how can I explain this? The, the, each Indian club has a balance, and it, it, just roughly speaking, if you take the overall length of say 18 inches of a club, um, if you go six inches down, 
from the base of the club, that's roughly where the weight will be. And then the, the rest of the um, 12 inches is going to be um, narrowing down into the handle and the pommel at the end of the handle. And, um, and that's basically a fairly sort of standard design. But then it's the adjustment of where exactly that weight falls in the relation to the distance from your wrist and how the club tapers at the end um, and whether it's quite square at the end or it tapers off softly or it tapers off like very, very smoothly. Like, let's say, for instance, like a, you know, a champagne flute. It comes down very, very smoothly from the, um, the, the widest part to the narrow part. This particular club has that sort of element of the, um, the shaping is just incredibly important. to the, And it has what's, what I call a soft feel. Where if a, if a club has um, the the weight further to the end on a squarer end, it's got a quite an aggressive swing to it, and an aggressive sort of feel. It falls differently when you swing it from overhead down to the ground. Interesting. That's that. It's unbelievable. Kind of hearing the just the the little details in the in the shape of uh, the club um, and how that can affect the the swing and the the arc. As it's moving through. Yes. The air. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's basically. I mean, we've we've kind of diversified now. We've gone from talking about me to talking into um, clubs. And I I am I think the next thing it might it might um, be worth sort of going into is um, just the way that I look at um, the training with clubs first before we talk start talking about history because some of this might help when I'm talking mention things. And um, I, um, I've followed quite a few different people, and that I'm talking about people for, um, in the sense of I've looked at um, Ed Thomas's work, for example, um, and Gray Cook, and um, a couple of other people. And then I wanted, I've also gone back and read a lot of ancient sort of text about it. And ancient, I'm talking about sort of, you know, 1860s onwards. There's one that I've got here that was. Um, uh, produced for the uh, the British military, it was 1868, and um, the, the it's now just so, okay. So into training, my concept about Indian club training is that um, there is it's a series of circles. So for example, if you 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 can have a straight arm circle, which means that the pivot point is from the shoulder. And your arm is absolutely straight and you, you hold the club with a sabre grip and you swing it in a circle in front of the body. There's nothing else. So that's basically what I term as a circle. Um, the, um, I differ from um, the sort of the teachings of, um, say, Gray Cook, where he they have a movement when they actually put two circles together, which to my way of thinking is a combination. Um, so let's just go on from the from the uh, from the circles. That's the front circle, a straight arm circle, and that's the fastest circles that you can swing with an Indian club, and that's regardless of the length. So you can do that with a 15 inch club, you can do it with a 26 inch club. Then, then the second circle, which is the, by far the most popular and the, the, one of the hardest ones for the the beginner to learn, is the back circle, which is swung over the shoulders either on the left-hand side or the right-hand side, and it requires the whole shoulder girdle to move forward. El the elbow comes forward and retracts. So go, come, the elbow comes forward on the sagittal plane and opens out onto the frontal plane, and the club goes around in a tight wrist circle behind the head. And now, just going back to the, um, the movement number one with, um, uh, with uh, Gray Cook, they put that together. That's one movement as far as they're concerned. But to me, there's two movements there. And that's where the beauty of um, the individual circles is, um, is, uh, works, where um, the, uh, the more you know about individual circles, the more interesting um, combinations you can swing. So you're not locked into a specific movement. Now, I'm not knocking what Greg Cook's doing because I think it's great. I mean, anything to get um, push Indian clubs forward is fantastic, but I've just got a different way of approaching the way that the circles are done because I think it's, it's like bread and butter to me. I mean, it's the basic underlying core of a, um, of a club swing. And I'll just quickly describe the others. So, uh, for instance, the, the, um, the, the, a, an open arm um, wrist circle can be done with a straight arm out on the frontal plane 
and literally the wrist you you use your wrist to spin the club on an outstretched arm which really pressurizes your shoulder um so th that's that one um the, th the fourth one is getting into um crossing the center line where the the right arm would swing a, a wrist circle in front of the left shoulder. And that can be done inwards and outwards like all the others. And then the last one is a lower back circle, which is basically sw swung where the right or left hand go um, down behind and rise up uh, on the spine and swing a circle behind you, so sort of lower back. So rather than being behind the head, it's, it's behind the lower back. And so there's five circles there, and they can all be swung inwards and outwards, so away from the body or into the body first. So now, if we, if you like, we can go on to um, the sort of bit, bit historically what's um, what sort of how this is all panned out because it always amuses me, you know. And even I, I actually haven't updated my um, website with this, and I, I'm just as much to blame as everybody else. I mean, that includes um, Wikipedia and so on. Everybody talks about Indian clubs. Okay, the British, the, the English army went to India. They saw the locals swinging clubs and thought, oh, wow, wow, wow let's go. <laughs> and um, there's, a, there's a lot more to it. And I, I got invited a while back now to, um, to do a lecture about the origins of clubs and, you know, how I came interested in them and so on. And I started digging and, my God, it just uh, all this sort of stuff came um, out. And I think... The first thing that I have to say is, I mean, there are, there are two kind of uh, sources and they're, they're really kind of mixed up to a certain degree. There's the old time Persian Empire and India. And now, they used to share a border at one stage. So that obviously there was traffic going across the border one way and the other. And what, what I'd like to start with is just to sort of um, basically talk about the... Um, the uh, the gada, which used to be a war weapon, and the Persians used to use it, and so did the Indians. And basically, that was a it was a short weapon. It's not like we know it today, where it sort of stands at say four foot four foot six um, when it stands on the ground. This, these were about three foot, um, and they were they were basically a war weapon that was used with um, you know quite a lot of skill because you've got this you know massive weight at the end of a handle. And it was um, a hand to -hand, it was a hand to hand combat um, um, weapon that was considered a destroyer of all opponents. And there's mythology um, which I'll touch on just with this um, that there was in um, Indian mythology there was um, a devil that was known by the name of Gada, and Gada basically terrorized humanity, but he had a, a sort of like a soft spot that he couldn't refuse a request. And um, he was asked by um, Lord Vishnu, who was another sort of one of the Indian gods, to um, basically uh, allow um, the Vishnu to, um, to the, he wanted to borrow the bones of Gada. And basically in that way, he destroyed Gada. And out of the, those bones, he fashioned himself the, the optimum mace. I mean, the, the first mace of its kind. So that, that's the story that the Gada actually came into being. So the, the, that's the way that it was created. And in uh, mythology, it has massive attributes. And a lot of the um, Indian gods stand with Gadas and they have different positions and they mean different things. But we, I mean, I don't want to sort of go into that too much at the moment. So from a fighting point of view, um, the, uh, the, there were very, very strict rules. Warriors were expected to train to, to hit the upper body and striking below the waist in a mace fight was considered cheating and basically unethical to do. So, um, you know, that was very much. And again, this is the short maces so that they would hit the, the upper body with them. But that went then basically morphed into the wrestler's mace. And um, then I'll talk about um, Persia in, in a minute. So in India, the um, Hanuman is basically, he bears a gada on his, um, I think it is right shoulder, and he um, carries a mount on his left. We'll just stick to the gada right now. So from the point of view of in India, the, um, the, I've mentioned them before, the Akharas or the... Um, the wrestlers' gyms, the gada serves as a, tra a training tool 
um, basically for throwing their opponents or practicing throwing their opponents over the shoulder. And um, but it swung in two styles basically in a 360, which is um, as it, it means it's in a circle, and a 10 to 2, which is basically swung like a clock face from 10 o'clock to 2 o'clock and then back again. So it stops, reverses, stops, reverses in that sort of format. And um, there's a lot of technique that's involved with that type of swing. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of a lot of um, very bad technique is crept through to um, like w w to to the West, shall we say, um, in Europe and in um, the States, where the handling of the actual sh mace shaft is is incorrect because everybody's holding them too high up in front of the chest, and they should be being drawn down basically below the belly button um, for uh, because that way you have control over the mace swing. So it's the um, the mace is controlled by you if you pull it down in front of you, whereas if the the um, the, the handle is held in front of the body at chest height, the mace controls you. You have you have very little control over the speed of the mace. So what happens is that it starts accelerating and it gets out of control very easy, especially for beginners. Um, so that it can be pretty scary. So just so the data, sorry. Does does it have a different um effect in terms of the, the the load and the musculature on the body in terms of bringing bring the hands down below the the waist level versus okay you know there's a very apart from controlling uh, controlling the speed of the mace if you think about it if you swing something over the shoulders and back around to the front center chest you're not really working your arms very much you're working your arms at the back of the head but you're not working your arms at the front if you drop your arms right down, that means that you're, you, you've got to lift much further up, dr um, push the mace behind your head, and, um, and then uh, um, bring it around to the other side again. So there is a very good reason, a physical reason for doing it too, is that the, you're getting a much greater workout and your range of motion is much greater with the, with the full movement. Now... That that does come at a cost because you cannot you cannot speed it up. But the thing is, I mean, you're getting the full benefit of the swing and and then the the um, the, the shall we say the pause at the front rather than uh, than a sort of like a whirly bird type of thing. You know, it's like a sort of wind farm type of effect when you when you're swinging from the chest. Um, another sort of just quickly on that one. Um, one of the most frightening things for most people is that they, they will death grip the handle because, I mean, they're actually scared of, you know, you, you, you're doing something pretty scary. You're dropping a weight behind your head. You've got to hang on to it as you bring it up on the other side of the body. And um, so what I'm talking about is that if, if, if the hands are clenched, the, the, um, the forearms are completely engaged and everything's really tight, so that means that, that mistake that I was talking about that my son and I were doing, that we weren't dropping the mace onto the nape of our neck. Um, so people are holding, you can see sw people swinging and their hands are passing the back of their head as opposed to the, their neck. And of course, they're going to suffer with um, elbow problems and so on as a result. So there's a lot of that. And you've got to relax because your hands actually do ch go from a hammer grip to a saber grip, depending on the position around the body where, where the handle is. And that's changing so, dynamically as it changes. Every position. every swing, I mean, you're going through two. I mean, each hand is changing position, um, and it's you know, I, I mean, I, I call it a light but firm grip on the mace. So that's just a little bit about that. So I mean, in the in the going on with that in the akharas historically, the the akharas use um, a club called a jory, and jory in um, from what I can understand in Hindi means a pair. So I mean, we call it in English. It says a jury clubs, but in in um, in, in in Hindi, it's um, a pair of clubs. And out of the jury, um, now these clubs stand from the ground. I mean, I'm five foot eight, and they will basically re reach nipple height. You know, so I mean, that's the, not touching, not picking them up, and so on. And um, there's three styles of them. There's a thin one, a fat one, and a nail jury. And I'll describe each one sort of just very briefly. 
So the clubs, um, they, they're not shaped like egg, sh uh, oh, sorry, like an elongated club with the, with the weight moves forward like on an Indian club. The weight is focused at the end of the club. So that means you've got that sort of fairly aggressive swing that I was mentioning earlier on with and when we were talking about the stars of, of, of actual clubs themselves. And if you if just imagining if it's standing on the ground, it's like a triangle with a handle on top. I mean, obviously, it's a cone shape and a handle on top. And usually there's a band of um, iron or something on the very end of it to make it um, heavier, to get it up to its uh, weight. And then they'll have them basically, you know, 10 kilos up to about 50 kilos. This is per club. So they're pretty heavy. Um, now, the thin club is designed for learners. So when you're, when you're basically a rookie swinging jury, um, you pick up one club and lay it on your shoulder, then somebody else lifts the other one onto your shoulder. And basically, um, each swing is like a one-handed mace swing. So you swing one club off your shoulder, drop it behind you, pull it up and slide it across your shoulder um, back to the resting position, and then the second club, the, the, the second club's ready to go. The fat jewelry is designed to be awkward, and that's there's no other better way of saying it. It's so big that it's very difficult to keep it on your shoulders. So you actually have to lift your arms up and elbows up to and hold the clubs like this to to keep you make that dip there so the club doesn't roll off if you like. Wow. So and it's, so they're 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 much harder to swing. They're much harder to control. They're they, um, at the minute the club drops off your shoulder, you've got to get it back up onto the um, back up onto the shoulder, and there's that tendency for the club literally to roll off. So I mean, you're really fighting the um, with the club in, in in the best way to describe it. And the final one um, is the nail jewelry, and the nail jewelry is pretty uh, a vicious. Um, I've got quite a few videos on my website about this. Um, the, they're basically a thin jewelry and they're covered with nails. I mean, not necessarily sharp, but I mean, they're going to do you damage if they go across your back. And the idea is basically that, you know, get, you get your swing, right. Otherwise you're going to screw yourself up. So, I mean, you know, you're going to basically, <laughs> and there's, you know, I mean, I don't know what the health and safety people would talk about it in the West, but I mean, certainly in India, this is you know, considered the norm and, you know, you just do it. So. It's a pretty scary piece of it. I mean, I've lifted them. and I've actually um, held a pair on my shoulders of 17 kilos each. Wow. And um, I just didn't quite have the nerve to have a go at swinging them. You know, it was just like, yeah, well, okay. Might just leave that one for now. <laughs> so, so now, so, okay. So now the, the mace, uh, I'm going to just taking the mace forward into um, the Persian Empire and um, what happened to it there. The Persian clubs of the meals are referred to in some older texts as basically a mace. And um, I want to talk about the sort of the morphing of the mace into the Persian meal, which I think is really interesting. Um, and I'm, but I'm going to start with uh, the, just to say this. The Zurkhane in Iran and um, old, old day Persia was a, um, a men-only ancient society which was formed to preserve the art of combat during periods of invasion. And club training basically is based on the sword and shield. And um, But there's not a sort of clear definition of when the, um, the mace became a meal, but the meal is referred to as a mace, so there's a definite crossover. And I'm not sure whether the, um, the meal, sorry, the mace um, came from Persia to India or vice versa, but I suspect in some ways it was the first um, it went from Persia to to India. Now, jumping back two and a half thousand years, five five hundred years BC, um, there was a um, a ruler of Persia called Cyrus the Great, and he had a um, an army of immortals. They were called, and, the, and there were ten thousand of them. There were ten thousand strong. And the idea of the immortals, or the name of the immortals, was to um, create a formidable army. And their technique was this, that they basically, if anybody um, um, died on the battlefield, their remains were immediately removed. So it looked as, looked as if oh, somebody fell, but did they die? We don't know. And in his place, the person who had been, let's say, killed, 
a, a reserve immortal would come in and take his place on the battlefield. So, I mean, this was the, basically the idea of the immortals. And there's a lot of legend and mystery um, about this. But what was very interesting, Cyrus the Great came up with a concept of the soldiers training with equipment that was heavier than their, their, their fighting equipment, and consequently the, the clubs came into being. And the, the idea was that the equipment had to be two to three times heavier than the sword and the shield. And if you analyze, um, and if you very carefully look at the, um, the, the mace, sorry, the, the, the meal swing, um, the static meal, say for instance, in my left hand, I've got one meal, and um, I'm going to swing the one on my right. So swing that behind the head. So the one that's swinging is the attacking arm, and the one on the left is the shield. And it basically moves across and across the body to defend you. Um, and then they turn, they change around. So I mean, it's been modified so that then you, you, because both meals are the same weight, so the other one swings. And that's kind of how the um, the concept of the uh, meal training came into being, was because of this sort of like idea of training with heavier equipment. So that means that the soldiers could fight for longer and have more endurance, and the and the rest of it, and you know, and and sort of be very fit. Because those battles, sometimes they went on for a few hours, sometimes they all went on for the whole day. And, I mean, if you suddenly, you're suddenly gassed out and you've got no energy left, I mean, it's tough. You know, you're probably going to lose your life as a result. So, yeah, so that's just a little bit about the immortals. And whilst we're on the subject of um, the Zulkane, so the Zulkane were these secret societies um, specifically um, designed to um, maintain the, the, the capability of combat. And um, these places are absolutely magic to go to. Um, and I've been to quite a lot of them in Iran now, and it's, it's just it's just amazing. You go down a very, very um, tight staircase. I mean, literally the shoulder width for one person, which was done for defense, basically. They, I mean, because these buildings are old. You go down the staircase and it winds around at least one half circle. You, and then it opens out into a two-story um, affair and it's kind of like a dome at the top with a single light, a single open um, space at the very top, like a circle or an octagon that lets light in. In the center of the Zurkane, there's an eight-sided um, pit, and it's called a gaud, G-A-U-D. And basically, everybody who goes into um, all the um, uh, the tr people who are going to be training, or the palavans, as they're called, drop down into the pit, which is about two feet down into this um, depth. They touch their f um, the pit floor, and then they um, touch their forehead or they kiss their um, fingers that have touched the floor as a mark of, mark of humility. And um, they also have to ask, they have a drummer who basically drums for them and keeps the beat going for them. So, I mean, that's really fascinating. And if you, I mean, I've been uh, had the, um, the honor and the pleasure of, of taking part in something like this, and you almost feel that everybody's training together. You, um, it's it's very very hypnotic the drum beat, and everybody's swinging the clubs in the same beat, and it's just sort of like you know the, as if everybody's spirits hanging in the middle of the room. It's just amazing. I mean, very exciting to do, and um, just a beautiful memory to keep. You know, you know, it was really, really fantastic. Okay, so moving on. So that's a little bit about the Zulkane. I mean, they do do other things. I'll just say very quickly. I mean, they do exercises on a Shena board, which is basically push-ups. And these push-ups are um, the most pop. One of the most popular is called the split push-up. And that means that your legs are split open um, as far as they will go. And you lean forward onto a Shena board and you will do push-ups to the drum beat. And there's two formats. They'll do them to a four count, which means that they'll they'll push back on their hips one, two, three, four, and then on the four they'll they'll do a um, push up. And then the faster version of that is on a two count, so you push back on your hips, push up, back on your hips, push up, and that's a two count. So one, two, one, two. So um, so they basically do the slow one first, and then. The, the beat basically doesn't really change, but if the drummer starts, you know, he's, he feels like he's going faster and um, you start doing these push-ups. They also do, um, they do a steel version of a, um, a bow and arrow, which is basically a chain. They weigh anything from 15 to 20 kilos and they swing them overhead. 
and um, they do a lot of also um, sort of um, movement exercises. I mean, they're like a sort of form of dance, but they they they, they basically to stretch you out. They're, they're stretch type exercises. Okay, so um, that's just a little bit about that because I think we've got quite a lot to cover here still. I wanted to get into um, the uh, the adoption of clubs, sort of the, the pre-colonial 19th century English soldiers, and this is the sort of funny bit, you know, they, they, they developed a strong interest in club swinging um, and adopted Indian clubs due to their admiration for the physiques that they were producing. And, I mean, they were in India they were using the, – the clubs were used by the police, by the military – um, and by the wrestlers in particular. And um, so it's just a so pardon me, I just missed a sheet here. So, yeah, the, the British Raj basically started uh, sort of about 1858 and through to 1947. And then the army was stationed over there and um, developed Indian clubs exercise as part of its own exercise drills. And we'll go into the um, the uh, the reasons why one of the reasons why is that, that when the British, the English army were in India they were very they were quite, honestly quite sedentary they they would basically train for an hour a day and they were also they succumbed to um, uh, things like for example cholera diarrhea dysentery malaria and um, the um, there's a clip I found in a, recently in, out of an English soldier's diary, which I'm going to read. So this is it: English soldier's diary. Bed till daybreak. Drill one hour. Bre breakfast served by the native servants. Bed. Dinner served by native servants. Bed. Tea served by native servants. Servants drink and bed. That was their activity during the day out of a British soldier's army. So, I mean, you know, the, the, the powers that be decided it's time we started training the, um, the troops, you know, just, just to improve the troop health because, I mean, there were, there were sedentary. There were, there was, you know, I mean, we talk about us being sedentary and, you know, sitting in chairs in front of computers. I mean, these guys were, you know, lying in bed all day, which is really quite amazing if you think about it. Um, so the club work started and um, the... Uh, I very recently found a book um, which is called The Regulation Club. Let me just get – I've got it up in here. It was a club that was designed by the English Army. Um, it was the first version. Now, in India, there were two clubs. I've mentioned the Jory, but there was also a shorter version called the Mugdal. And the Mugdal was maybe, um, uh, I would say, about 26 inches long, 30 inches long at the max, um, not, a, not carrying a lot of weight. The English decided to shorten this club, and the the the, the length of this club was basically from the um, the, the the fist just to, to just past the elbow, and it was tubular, so the, the, there was no shaping whatsoever. I mean, the shaping came at a much later date, and they were called regulation clubs. And I found a book on the internet recently, um, which is called a series of exercises for the regulation clubs. Um, published first 1863. The exercises in that book are very basic, but these were the exercises that were used for the British, for the English Army, and for the local um, Indian Army. But then, sort of like weird things started happening because um, the the uh, the English decide or, or they started thinking of the Indian Army basically as unruly, undisciplined, and so on. So. They used to go out, um, they used to, foot, basically, they'd have to get dressed in their full uniform in the burning hot sun, I would imagine, sometimes in India. And they would go out and onto the training fields and swing these clubs. These regulation clubs were four pounds each. They were not light clubs. So now you, you've got to imagine a soldier in full uniform out in the burning sun, basically swinging a pair of four pound clubs. In, in a format of exercises um, out of this book, it, you know, basically it's all, almost like sort of torture to a certain degree because, I mean, they, and the concept of the English at the time was we have to discipline the Indians to, you know, to be, so that their army becomes as disciplined as uh, our English army is. So they wanted to make them sort of almost equal to it. 
Um, other things sort of happened there uh, too. So you, now you've got the English sort of taking the clubs over and, and kind of making them their own, um, developing exercises for them. But you've got the sort of traditional wrestler still with his jewelry, still with his mace, um, swinging their types of exercises. So the exercises were kind of actually splitting open. And, you know, this is the sort of the interesting thing now. I mean, from my journeyings, I've found that um, there's a lot of um, crossover of, for instance, swinging a meal to swinging a mace to swinging a light Indian club. There's, there, there's a lot of common ground there in some of the movements. Obviously, some are handling more heavier weights, others are not. Um, but, the, you know, the, there was a definite split and it was such a split to the point that um, the English considered the Hindus as um, a little bit effeminate because of the clothing and the sort of like the long types of um, shawls and stuff that they would wear, the traditional wear. And they prided themselves in this strict uniform and, and so on. And they considered, the, as I say, the, Hin the Indians effeminate. And out of that came a movement in India to prove the English wrong, which um, basically encouraged physical exercise amongst the Hindus in particular to take up mace swinging and jewelry swinging and so on. And, and the modern day Akara apparently, um, which I, I, I thought it was a lot older, uh, I, I, I've discovered since then it was actually born around about this time. So sort of from about say 1830 through to the, at the end of the 18th century, that was when the, um, that, um, actually came into being in the way it is now. And one of the biggest um, sons of that movement of, of proving the, the masculinity of the, the male um, Hindu was the great Gama, who was a wrestler, never beaten. He traveled to Europe many times and he wrestled. He, he would put down, you know, throw down the gauntlet to any wrestlers that were around. Um, and he was just a, an incredible fighter. And I mean, never, as I say, never got beaten in um in all the all the fights that he had, so there was you know there's a contrast of what the clubs are doing and the way that they're being handled by the different groups. So the um, let's just go to this. So traditional colonial use, the traditional use in India was the akhara, the wrestlers and conditioning, and also there was um, um, swung for strength, which was very rhythmic and around the body. And then in contrast, the colonial use in India and spreading to Europe was military training, discipline, and prevention of diseases. And um, on the, or from a medical point of view, Indian club swinging was then prescribed um, for health benefits because basically with all those soldiers that are lying around on their backs in their beds, they were making them get up and um, it was considered um, a great benefit um, to fight disease, basically, was to prescribe um, club swinging to the troops. It was also um, greatly um, instrumental in female emancipation with the suffragettes, for example. Um, and there's another political angle, which I'll get onto a little bit later on. Okay, so now different clubs for different exercises. I'll just touch on this very, very um, uh, quickly. So just going back, the Hindu clubs, the Mugdal and the Jori are swung around the body rhythmically. And it's in an asynchronous format. So that means that one arm is working and the other one is uh, still. And that's what I class as a closed arm style. So the arm will never straighten during that process. On the other hand, the, um, the English clubs, or um, for the time being, we'll call them the regulation clubs because they weren't actually called Indian clubs at this stage. Um, sw the, the swinging was primarily focused in circular motions, either overhead or to the side on the frontal plane. And they were performed both synchronous and asynchronous. Um, and um, the first, that means the synchronous being more strenuous and the asynchronous being more relaxing. So, I mean, and I, mean, I still believe that to this day and just from my um, experiences that I've had with clubs, that if you allow the clubs to swing, um, you know, asynchronous, so a back circle with one hand and a front circle with the other, um, it's much more relaxing and it's kind of a, like a resting mode. If you swing both clubs out, two front circles, two back circles, that's much more strenuous. So the, the difference between the um, the you know the English use and the Hindu use was it was pretty pretty big, 
And which leads me on to the sort of social trends. So uh, the club swing became a social and political phenomenon. Hin Hindu wrestlers swung clubs differently to Indian soldiers because the Indian soldiers used the regulation clubs, the, um, the wrestlers used the jewelry, and the, who in turn swung clubs differently to Englishmen. And similarly, English men swung clubs differently to English women. And just to sort of um, expand this a little bit, for example, by this time, the, um, the average man's club had gone down to two pounds from four pounds. And yet for women, they were prescribing what's commonly known as a scepter or, an, um, or it's like a mini mace, if you like, to give you a sort of, you know, you can imagine it's like a, a, a bit of a ball about the size of a tennis ball, but slightly elongated. And the club's called a teardrop or a scepter. And these clubs were considered to be um, the appropriate client, club for women to use. Um, but the, basically, I mean, it, it, I, mean, it would, I mean, there's a bit of sort of um, discrimination there, but we'll come back to that in a minute. The, um, now, in both in India and in England, the ability to swing Indian clubs proficiently offered employment possibilities as a physical education instructor. So this is going back sort of, you know, 1870, 1880. I mean, this was already being, being um, it was hugely popular um, and um, becoming more so as, as time went on. I'm going to touch a little bit on um, sort of other uses for clubs, clerics and clubs. There's a, there's a Bayou um, tapestry of William the Conqueror um, um, and during the Battle of Hastings in 1066. And um, it shows um, Odo, the Bishop of Bayou, swinging a, um, a, a club amidst um, Norman horsemen. Now, the, the idea was that the clerics were not allowed to use a sharp object. They were not allowed to use, draw blood, basically, that that was only to, for the foot soldiers to do. So, I mean, you know, if you were a cleric and a warring bishop or something like that, you could only hit people across the head with something heavy. And um, so the, mili yeah, the militant clergy had to fight without shedding their, their enemy's blood and were forbidden to use swords. And it's a total misconception because if you think about it, a blunt weapon is, is going to break the skin. There's no question about it. And it's going to draw blood. So, I mean, you know, I don't know where that's come from, but it's really a bit of a sort of fairy tale. Now, moving on back to Britain, the beginnings of the, beginnings of the Indian Club movement. Um, there was a guy called Professor Harrison. Big, um, very, very, he was the strongest man in the UK, 1860s. And he developed routines for swinging Indian clubs, but he's always depicted with something that looks more like an, um, a Persian meal than an Indian club. And the records um, that I've found show him sort of, he was a, pre he liked progressive loading and he used to swing clubs from seven pounds up to about 37 pounds. And apparently he had a, one club which was um, 47 pounds in weight. That was just a single one. So um, now, in those, that was at the time of Queen Victoria. She was um, the Queen of England at the time, and she was the Empress of India. And he, um, Professor Harrison, demonstrated club swinging in front of her, and basically she gave the royal seal of approval for club swinging, and then the British or the English public in his day um, embraced club swinging as a new sport. And that was basically the beginnings of um, the, um, the whole fad of club swinging from sort of 1830 through to sort of the um, early 19th, sort of 1920s and so on. Um, at the same time, Sim D. Kehoe or Simon D. Kehoe, which is the guy that I mentioned earlier on of the, the, those very old clubs that I copied and I really love the way that they swing. He went to the UK. He was an exercise um, equipment manufacturer in the, in the States. And he visited England in 1861 and witnessed a demonstration by Professor Harrison. And he was like completely, you know, like bowled over by this. Um, returning home, he introduced Indian clubs to America, basically. He modified the designs he saw in the UK and started selling them to the public. He also uh, was very forward thinking and he sent them to all the clerics and the judges in America. And um, even I think one to the president of the day. You know, the, the, you know, this is the sort of the new exercise thing, you know, get, you know, get, get into it. 
So which and he also then four years later, 1866, published the first American manual called the Indian Club Exercise. Now we're going to skip and change the subject here. Now, at the same time that this was all going on, I just want to paint a bit of the background of what was happening, the Industrial Revolution and the beginnings of um, the sedentary lifestyle. And I'll, I'll say straight away that in a lot of the early books, a lot of the, um, the comments are, and I'm going back to sort of 1860 and then sort of mid um, up to the sort of um, 1900s, that they were complaining about a sedentary lifestyle. And the Indian clubs were a fantastic tool to get people moving. And we'll come back to that. So the Industrial Revolution started in England and America and attracting workers from all walks of life. And people started living in towns and cities in ever increasing numbers and working in factories and offices rather than outdoors and on the land. Hence the sedentary lifestyle. And this started impacting on everybody's well-being, both physically and spiritually. So, and, and you know, you can just imagine it. I mean, there would have been um, roomfuls of, for instance, like in accountancy firms, you know, filling in ledgers by hand. I mean, there were, there were no computers in those days. I mean, they were, all that sort of stuff was being done by hand. And the men would be working in factories, probably pulling a lever on a machine or whatever they were doing, really mundane work. So the, the switch was basically from working outdoors on the farm into an industrial area. So that's just painting a bit of the background. Hence, now something that comes along at the same time was called muscular Christianity. And um, that was basically a huge um, sort of, uh, it was the, the concept was a good Christian, you had to be physically fit. And now you can imagine, typically on a Sunday, you'd go to a Sunday service and then everybody would go to the church hall and what would they do? They'd swing clubs. They'd swing Indian clubs in the church hall to somebody playing the piano, probably waltzes because waltzes um, have a 4-4 beat and so everybody can swing together and um, there would be somebody up on stage leading them and you know they'd have a sort of social event and then they'd obviously probably go home and have lunch and stuff. But muscular Christianity had a sort of you know big influence on – I mean, on the um, the way that um, the popularity of Indian clubs happened sure. in those days, sure. so it was it was a really really big deal, big big deal. Um, the I'm just going to touch a little bit on the, further on Christianity. Christianity was the old style Christianity, as opposed to the masculine Christi uh, muscular Christianity, was c being considered sort of effeminate, and I mean they. Um, in the women in those days were also um, not um, prone to doing any sort of major amounts of walking or um, any form of exercise. And um, the masculine Christianity kind of pulled women out of it. So there was an emancipation happening. I mean, women could, were, it was suddenly allowed for them to exercise. And that also meant that they got rid of corsets. I mean, this was a, this was a huge deal. So for, as far as a woman was concerned, she could go to a Sunday, Sunday service and afterwards she could have a workout with her fellow parishioners or whatever it was and swing clubs with everybody else. And, you know, the idea, of, for instance, the fainting women because the corsets were so tight, fainting rooms and all that sort of Victorian stuff just basically disappeared. And that's just a sort of bit of background of what was going on. Um, now, this is the, it's some of the fun bits. There was a, there was a guy in the States – called Gus Hill. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. And he was a sort of really colorful entertainer. He was a very, very good club swinger. He was born 19, sorry, 1858. He was a complete Indian club enthusiast, but he was also a performer. I mean, like a stage performer. And in those days, early days, you know, feats of strength and all this type of thing were um, very, very popular. And he had a road theater show, traveled um, amongst all the cities in the States and um, basically perf doing live performances. Now, here comes the good bit. Gus Hill's Indian clubs were of staggering weight, and they really were. I mean, I, I've got sort of old um, pictures of him here. You know, he's standing next door to a club that's reaching up to his shoulder. I mean, he was, um, I think, just about five foot five. So, I mean, it was a big club. And on it is written 150 pounds. Oh, my. And he, what he would do, what he would do, 
was he would exhibit, I mean, in, he exhibited in theater lobbies before each show. And he'd invite men and boys from the audience to try and see if they could lift the clubs, which, of course, they couldn't do. And why was that? Because they were basically loaded with lead shot, because he was a bit of a charlatan, but I'll explain that in a minute. So very few could lift them up and much less perform any feats of strength with these clubs. And um, yet Gus Hill, when he was on strange, could on stage, he could swing them around like there was no, you know, that was his uh, peanuts, basically. So he was a bit of a charlatan, charlatan and a cheat. But I'm going to I'm going to say something in his defense now. The explanation of the uh, of uh, of the, the weight was in the false bottoms that basically disgorged lead weights out of the clubs. A charlatan and a cheat, yeah, okay. However, you've got to still consider um, Hill's um, skill with Indian clubs because those clubs would have been still um, basically quite solidly made to be able to carry the weight and be moved around even in the reception of a hotel. So even if a club stood up to his shoulder, he would still have to probably swing that 200 a bit, a bit like a mace. It would have taken some, you know, some um, skill to do that. And, you know, as a, um, as a performer, I mean, that was the height of his you know, performances. So, yeah, he was a, quite a character, colourful guy. Um, moving on to another proponent was um, an Australian named Tom Burrows, who was a... Um, uh, a um, endurance swinger. He was born 10 years later, 1868. Um, he won championships of club swinging in Australia and New Zealand. And um, basically, and he was um, a great proponent of um, health in mining here in Australia. So he would basically go down into gold mines in, in the gold rush areas, get the miners out and have them swinging clubs and breathing fresh air on the surface. And then before they went back down to the dust and the diesel fumes below, because, I mean, you know, the, the ventilation wasn't a big thing in those days. And um, he, his pinnacle of um, uh, endurance was um, in Aldershot in the UK. He swung a pair of, um, I think it was three pounds, six ounce Indian clubs for 100 hours nonstop, which is one hell of a feat. Yeah, but the thing is, I mean, okay, drugs did come into it. They they use something called ephedrine, which is, I mean, the base of something. I'm not, a, I, mean, I don't know much about this sort of stuff, but basically, it used to pep him up. But some of the funniest recounts of his endurance was the fact that, um, apart from the ephedrine, he his coach would have to feed him, so he'd have to swing circles behind his head because he wasn't allowed to stop. So he'd swing circles behind his head. Whilst his, um, his coach would feed him sort of um, hard-boiled eggs, apparently, and chocolate. You know, that's basically all he could stomach because he, he complained that it was very hard to swallow anything with that continuous movement going on. Right. And then he'd drink, uh, he'd drink an English drink called Bovril, which is like a beef extract type of thing. So, yeah, that, and, and he was um, uh, basically affiliated to the, um, the British Army in Aldershot, training um basically training the soldiers in um in swinging indian clubs just for sort of you know for fitness general fitness so a few other just a few other bits and pieces about this we're nearly to the end of it um another very interesting story about indian clubs 1903 um indian clubs inspired the shape of the now famous perrier bottle um the bulbous t-shaped bottle um is um, and they're, they're green. The distinctive green bottles were um, designed by John Harmsworth, who was a, a financier from the UK, who became. Um, he was a great fitness fanatic, but he became. Um, he had a leg injury in a, ca a car accident and basically was bound to a wheelchair. And he used to train, which you can do, with Indian clubs in a sitting position. And I've, I've done videos about it, and um, Army Maguire has done videos about sit, the seated position of um, club swing, which is great for a few people. And there's one guy I know in um, Brazil, um, in Brazil, right in Rio, who's um, disabled basically, but his upper body is great, so I mean, he can swing clubs, and it can be used there too. Now let's move on to the suffragettes, our ladies. We've got to get the ladies into line here. So the suffragettes were they wanted the vote, obviously, to for women, women's vote. Now you've got to consider it going back to the um, the uh, 
the church service and everybody swinging clubs afterwards and mixed setups and so on, women could swing clubs really well. And the suffragettes realized this and they would basically hide Indian clubs for their protest marches and so on in the, the folds of their skirts. And they worked out two things. The English um, bobby or the policeman or the constable, they, they've got their sort of pointed helmets at the top. And they realized that each policeman in the, in the UK at the time had to, they owned their own helmet. So if they lost their helmet, they'd have to pay for a new one, which was about a month's salary. So the suffragettes realized that if they knock the helmet off with a pair of, <laughs> with a club, the policeman would rather go running for the club than try and, um, you know, stop doing what he's doing. <laughs> he'd lose his concentration. So that's what another, there's a nice little story about them. And the other thing that they do, the, um, the mounted police in England at the time used to back their horses against a line of women in a protest march. They'd back them so the horse's bum would go into the women. And they worked it out so that if they hit the horse's knee from behind into the fold of the knee, it wouldn't hurt the horse, but the horse would sit down and the policeman would fall off. So, I mean, it would, they'd, they'd be thrown into disarray, you know, four or five or six women did the same thing to horses standing in a line. I mean, basically, they'd be, um, you know, um, they'd be um, got one up on the on the policeman and probably could get through the barricade of the of the horses. So, it's just a, you know, another use for Indian clubs. Anyway, just back it back into the modern day time in the Olympics. The Indian clubs were first um, displayed in 1904, and then then that was in the St. Louis, Missouri Olympics. And then in 1932, Los Angeles, California. Um, the popularity of the clubs in the Victorian Edwardian um, era cannot be underestimated. That um, basically, but the, now there's something there's something strange because um, if you think about it, Tom Burrows, who I mentioned a while ago, he was a, a, a very very proficient club swinger. He didn't go to the 1904 Olympics. Um, and basically, and what was the reason for that? Because the clubs were already starting to decline. And one of the reasons was a guy called Eugene Sandow, who's featured for Pavel features in his book, um, Enter the Kettlebell. Because in the, in this, between sort of 1900 and 1910, the bodybuilding thing was starting to become, you know, like a major influence. And especially, specifically for men, you know, and well, how did he do that? How did he get such a perfect physique and so on? So, um, you know, the, the swing started going moving away because the physique with Indian club swinging was different to the the body that Eugene Sandow developed, and consequently, the, it was the beginning of the decline. And I've never managed to find out why Burroughs, for example, didn't go to the 1904 Olympics because he would have been perfectly capable. Um, but I've got a feeling that already there were moves then to try and um, move away from that. His, um, Burroughs' um, 100 hour swing was 1913. And I think that was done basically to try and revive the interest in Indian club swinging, but it was definitely on its decline by then. And by 1920 and the uh, LA Olympics 1932, the decline was very much more and basically they never returned to the Olympics once that was um, done. So yeah, no, and then basically, you know, once once that happened, um, organised sports came um, into the states in particular. I mean, the UK the same, basketball, gridiron, American football, and I mean that kind of took over from the sort of you know the the organised or the the militarised type of club swinging. So it sort of kind of stepped forward, and people changed their ideas about what they should be doing. So, quick question for you. Did you have any, um, in your research, did you have any insight into why there was such a gap between the 1904 and 1932 Olympics? Like why they didn't do it to the next consecutive one? Well, I think one of them would have been um, World War One mm -hmm. would have seriously affected that. And um, maybe it was just, uh, I mean, apart from that, I mean, I'm just guessing here. I really don't know. And I haven't found anything to tell me um, otherwise, I have to be honest. But no, that is a huge jump from one uh, from one period to another. There's there's no doubt about it. And then the other the other question I had was, um, did you uh, in your research did you ha come across anything that, that um, described how they were, uh, I guess, graded or assessed during the Olympics in terms of like how somebody would win a gold medal versus silver, like how it was judged? 
No, there, okay. Uh, I do. I do know, and um, that's just from my own practice and stuff. Um, there, in in um, Indian club, there is a specific um, a footwork type of uh, discipline that you have to um, adhere to. As a beginner, you would stand with your feet shoulder width apart, but um, and that's called the informal stance. For the Olympics, the formal stance was basically with the um, the heels touching and toes pointing out, maybe it's sort of like, um, I don't know, 60 degrees or whatever. So, I mean, their feet were slightly out. And what that does is it, it reduces your floor footprint from the wider shoulder width to a much more, um, you know, harder to balance um, footprint. And um, the influence of... Um, Hip movement was still very much dictated to by the Victorians, and it was considered basically impolite and rude to move your hips. So the the focus, the Indian club focus for both the Olympics, from what I can understand, was um, it was upper body. You could transverse turn to a certain degree to left and right, um, but basically you had to be facing forward and your hips were forward. So I mean, it was it was you know very much um, the body from the waist downwards was still. And you were using that smaller footprint. And then it was, uh, I, I suspect that it would have been um, a little bit of showmanship involved in it. But, you know, they might have been set exercises. I've never actually really found them, but it would have been interesting to check out whether they would have, say, had like in gymnastics set exercises and then freestyle. Um, but I suspect it would have been maybe a combination of the two. I don't know. I, I, I really, I'm guessing here a bit. No, that's great. I was just curious. So um, yeah. very, very interesting to me. Yeah, no. So I mean, and that basically brings me down to sort of you know to to modern day um, to my d- discovering clubs um, over the internet basically, and then I started I started filming myself to to check out my own form originally, and then um, somebody said, oh, well, you should put that up on YouTube, and that's basically how I got into the YouTube and. Um, then morphed into um, a website and so on. So recording my travels and stuff. And now, now that, I mean, there's, um, you, you know, so much healthy interest about this form of um, exercise, even to the point um, yesterday I was down at um, our local Navy base here in um, West Australia, and um, those guys there still wear the, the, insig- the crossed insignia on their shoulder, on the left shoulder of two clubs crossed, and yet the Navy in Australia stopped using Indian clubs years ago. Wow. And, now they, and now they're coming back to um, looking at um, you know, using them just purely to get people away from computers, from desk jobs, just to give them a bit of movement. Um, and they're looking at it for rehab. Um, we, we, do, we had a major discussion yesterday about, um, you know, even for um, soldiers who have been hurt and stuff, to, you know, to, because... Because Indian club work is mental as much as it is physical. So consequently, um, from from a point of view of somebody who's injured, um, they can get their sort of um, their um, get themselves moving, and then they can start doing intric- intricate designs or intricate patterns with Indian clubs, which just helps the brain function sort of you know prosper basically and, and get better and better. And the, um, so. Yeah, so I mean, that's one. And I've, this week, funnily enough, I'm going to the first um, West Australian dojo to um, start talking. Well, I'm going to do two hours training with them and showing them how to do basic movements with Indian clubs. So that will be good. Fantastic. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Did you want to, um, since you just brought up about um, sort of the, the physical and the mental benefits, did you want to um, use this as an opportunity to talk about um, sort of some of the neurological and then also the differences that you've come across with with children versus um, the elderly. Sure. Well, I, I'm, and I've taught I've taught basically in um, in a school of sort of uh, they were about between seven and nine years old as, as kids, and uh, we used basically a um, a dowel. Um, it was in fact slightly too long. They were about eighteen inches long, where they needed to be a little bit shorter, and we just literally. Took, bought a whole heap of tennis balls, cut a little cross in them, and shoved the dowel into the tennis ball. That was the Indian club that the kids used. So it was, it was, it was like the scepter or the women's club that I was talking about earlier on. That kind of sort of um, shape, very lightweight. And the, I was just completely amazed at the ability of the kids to pick up the movements. Um, basically, the front circle and the back circle, um, and being able to join the two together. 
and also to be able to cross the center line of the body and maintain the frontal plane, which I was just amazed at the, the, the speed that they picked that up with. And in complete contrast with adults, um, and that's adults from 20 years um, upwards, because I haven't taught anybody younger, um, up to people of my age, um, you know, in their 60s and 70s, um, well, that's a, people really struggle with maintaining the frontal plane. You'll be able to swing through and keep that circle as flat as possible. The easiest way to describe it is on the frontal plane when the circle is swung. When you were at school and you were given the compass for the first time, and you probably sort of, you know, you stuck the point into a piece of paper and, and you scribed a circle around the, um, the point and you suddenly had a flat circle. An Indian club circle is exactly the same. It's two-dimensional. It should not have a shape to it. Okay, there's limitations because it's swinging around the body, so it is going to go slightly off plane, but basically it has to move as flat as possible, so there's no deviation there. Um, and um, I, yeah, I mean, when I teach an adult class, the adult classes basically have to work on the, um, the crossing the center line and um, changing from one circle to another a lot harder than the kids did, which I think is very interesting. Although once once adults pick it up, they do it very well. There's no question about that. Do, um, compared to the kids, what's the time for the learning curve for the, the adults? I would say the kids would be an hour, the adults would be three. Wow. It's so quite a bit of difference, quite a bit of difference. Um, yeah, no, I mean, there's, it's surprising. I mean, I, I think the sort of those early skills, I mean, we must lose them as we get older and we're, we, we restrict ourselves in our movements. I mean, you know, do, even during a sort of normal day, you're basically your hands are um, at, sh at elbow level, whether you're at a desk or whether you're looking at your iPhone or whatever it is, um, the hands don't go up above your head or the, the biceps doesn't go level with the floor by being shoulder high. So that's one, and that's where adults start to struggle, and kids don't. The kids have no problem getting their arms up here, whereas um, adults do, because it's something that they haven't done for years in most cases. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. That makes a ton of sense. Yeah, so it's um, something that we have to work on, and um, yeah, yeah. So... Um We've we've already covered a ton of ground. Um, we we had we had a couple of other topics um, sure. down. So did did you um, did you want to touch on about um, the importance of the weight distribution with the gata and making a homemade gata versus um, some of the the ones that are being manufactured? Uh, you know, present, sure. present day. Yeah, yeah, no, no problem. I um, my first gata was a, um, a manufactured one. And um, it was 12 kilos, and it had a fairly thick handle on it, um, which the thick handle restricts the, the, the grip movement on your hand. And on my first visit to India, going into an Akara, the, um, the gutters were completely different. They were just a, basically a lump of stone on the end of a bamboo stick. And my first, my, my first reaction to that was, well, how the hell, how the hell does you know, that stay on there? Right. And not, um, you know, not fall off and hit somebody on the head or go flying off and hit somebody else. And um, but to my amazement, basically, they were very secure. I mean, they were fine. I swung them myself and I thought, OK, I'm going to find out how they make these. And I was expecting my guide at the time. I said, well, you know, where do they go? Where do they go to make this? Oh, they, everybody makes their own. <laughs> and um, so well, how do they make them? Oh, is it, they make it with a clay pot. What do you mean a clay pot? So he took me to a pottery shop, and there were unfired clay pots there, basically. And he said they just, you know, they just make the cement up and um, pop, pop the cement into the um, into the pot. Then they um, stick the bamboo in it with two nails crossing over like that, and the nails keep the the bam the the bamboo and the um, the concrete in touch with each other, and the head doesn't fall off. In a few other places, I did see them where there were um, there was just a circular hole in a stone, and they 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 just driven wooden wedges in there to stop the thing from falling off. Now, what's the difference between a man-made um, or a factory-made steel mace 
and an Indian Garda. I'm going to call and I call them separate um, Indian Garda and Steel Mace for for a very good reason. The the weight distribution on an Indian Garda is the weight is completely um, in the stone itself. There's nothing in the handle. The bamboo is very very light, very very strong and very light. And you can use um, the uh, bamboo handle about an inch, an inch and a quarter um, diameter, no problem at all, and it will serve you well. I've got them here in my house, plenty of videos to prove it. On the other hand, a steel mace, because of the nature of the way it's made, it is made, the handle is made out of steel. There is weight in the steel, and it throws the, um, the balance off. Now there is a couple of there. I know that there, some people have tried very very hard to make um, to use air, um, well, aircraft um, technology to make handles with, but they're still on the heavier side. In, the, in an effort to make them light, they use that type of technology or metalwork te technology, but there's still weight in the handle, and I um, so consequently you've got. Um, you're lifting up like a barbell and a, a, a ball on the end of it. So there's weight everywhere. And the difference is basically, I describe it as swinging an Indian Gada is like driving a Ferrari as opposed to swinging a, um, um, a, a steel mace, which is like driving an old school bus. You know, it's heavy and it's, and it's awkward and it's not, it does not have the flow of a, um, a concrete a bamboo mace, basically. So the um, and I mean you know from from a sort of a private point of view, I mean you can have, I've got three four maces here in in my um, you know I've got seven kilos, ten and fourteen, which is enough for me. I don't really need any more than that. I know some guys like to go heavier. That's fine, whatever you, whatever you want to do. But they're really cheap to make, and um, I still don't get the logic of the. Um, the, the factory made one simply because it, it, it's unbalanced to me. It's not balanced the correct way um, to, 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 I think, to get the full benefit from it. So what would be some of the drawbacks because it's not balanced uh, the, with the proper weight distribution? What would be well, some I of think the potential ramifications to the, to the individual or to the body? Okay. The, one, of the, one of the problems with that is that the, the – um, they tend to have a steel mace tends to have a slightly thicker handle or certainly a lot of the ones that I've come across. Now, if you think about the way that you grip something, if something, if you, if you've got a fairly narrow handle, for instance, like say an inch wide, you can, you can move your fingers from a saber grip to a hammer grip very, very easily. You have to change grip when you swing a mace, you have to, or you, when you do it properly. On a thicker handle, your grip movements are uh, more restricted. Mm -hmm. So you're going to be more working more with the, with the hammer grip or something that's um, um, similar to the hammer grip, but you cannot move your fingers around as much as you can as with a thinner handle. So consequently, you're going to swing more from your chest and um, you're not going to do that drawdown that I'm always looking for with all my students as I want them to draw that um, handle right down. Just recently, I, I went to Korea for um, a, th um, a three-day workshop, and Mace was part of that. And the guys over there made a, a heap of them, I think about 20-odd um, bamboo concrete maces, and they used a plastic um, a spherical light fitting, which is fine. And they left the light fittings on. So, I mean, you've got a plastic surround, concrete inside with the – and, I mean, we used them inside a, um, a dojo, which had beautiful – sort of matting on it, and there was no way that that matting was going to get ripped up because there was no concrete, direct contact with concrete. Sometimes they would be, you know, obviously the mace head's going to get dropped, but the, um, you know, the way that they were made was really, really good. So, I mean, I'd, and I'd encourage everybody to do at least have one mace like that. I mean, okay, have your, um, like I did, I had my uh, manufactured mace, steel mace, but then I've, I've, I've basically now, I hardly ever use it. It's a dust collector as far as I'm concerned now, the, the steel maze, because you just don't use it. it just, it's just so different. And, it, and I think the, the biggest thing is restriction of movement because of the way you have to grip it is one of the things that I would say is um, from the maces that I've seen. Now, I'm going to touch on something else about the mace and the length of the handle, which I think is really interesting. Sure. 
there there is an obsession or it would seem to be that there's an obsession oh let's get the mace you know let's let's do a six foot handle let's do a seven foot handle and i just would like to remind everybody that when if a mace stands at say four foot for argument's sake and let's say the measurement from your wrist to your elbow is a foot just to make to round figures up and i'm talking wrist to elbow when the mace is in the front of the body it stood four foot tall in, from your hands. When you swing it behind you, because you've got to, to extend your triceps, your forearm and the mace handle become one because you're swinging from the elbow. That means that the handle lengthens by a foot, so it becomes a five foot mace. Okay, so there's and you've got a, this this length changing syndrome, which also happens in Indian clubs, by the way and to a certain degree Persian meals, but you're lengthening and you're shortening, you're lengthening and you're shortening, and then you've got a, a huge amount of um, grip work because the grip work is asymmetric, like right over left and then left over right, and um, you should be basically swinging and allowing for this um, your length change to actually happen. Now, the length change is not going to happen if you swing from behind your head. It's only going to happen if you get a full triceps extension. So, you know, the um, the... And to get a full tricep extension, you can't have the handle too fat, you know, too thick, basically. So a thicker handle is going to be an, an, an obstruction to you, and it's going to hinder your movement, to, to, in my opinion, anyway. So, um, yeah. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. So, and I just wanted to touch on that with um, Indian clubs. With Indian clubs swinging, as I mentioned earlier on with the circles, the circles – um, that you swing, you also change the length of a club um, uh, by, say, swinging just from the pommel at the end of the club, mm -hmm. gripping the handle completely in a saber grip, and then doing what's called a ring grip, which is basically the forefinger and the thumb gripping the handle and shortening the club uh, by moving the pivot point closer to the weight itself. So there's, a, there's an element of length changing depending on the speed and the size of the circle that you want to swing. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. I, I feel like I got, I got a lot more uh, rereading and research to do after speaking with you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, I mean, I just thought I would just touch on sort of like, you know, the benefits. I, I mean, I've worked with quite a few um, – you know, power lifters and stuff, and um, the um, I think the benefit, one of the biggest benefits that they get out of this, a lot of them um, over a period of time start getting restricted in the range of motion by not being able to get their arms out onto the frontal plane sure. completely. And um, Indian clubs definitely helps to sort that out and get the, get the mobility back into um, place. And I've seen that on quite a few um, people, and that's particularly um, when they're working with an outward, so away from the body, away from the center of the body, a synchronized swing on both sides, so that both both shoulders are working. But asynchronous will do it too. And you don't have to go for a massive weight. Two to two and a half pounds worth of weight of clubs is plenty enough for, for that mobility to come back really easily. Now, um what are do you have any recommendations for um, you know like the Indian club? Uh, obviously, you just touched on the, the gada and the steel mace, but uh, the Indian club or the Persian meal. Like, what are some things that if an individual is interested in purchasing some, what should they be looking out for to make sure it's a good quality, um, you know, club? As far as Indian clubs are concerned. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Okay. First, first of all, um, I mean, a couple of ba basic things. Um, they need to be um, basically very smooth so that they, they're not rough wood because you don't want to get splinters into your hands. So they have to have some form of finish on them. Um, Mike Romiski from um, Rosewater Kinetics does a, an incredible job in the States. I mean, he's based in Idaho. I was actually going to go – funnily enough, I was going to go for my um, – I was going to leave for my trip today, which I had to cancel – um, and I would have been on my way over to the States to, um, later on today. Never mind. Anyway, I, and Mike would have been one of the people that I would have gone to see. I mean, he and I have been sort of talking and, um, and um, doing some work together. I designed a pair of clubs um, for, his, um, for him to sell and manufacture in the States 
for the uh, Indian club tour that I was going to do. And then we sort of personalized them with as a signature range instead. But anyway, going back to the weights, for a man, two pounds. If a man is unfit, one pound. If a man is a little bit taller, let's say getting up to about a six foot, I would suggest two and a half pounds, but two pounds is still going to get them through the basics. For women, basically, um, if, a, if a woman is very, very fit, like some, some ladies are, two pounds will probably be fine. But then, um, then I would recommend maybe one and a half for somebody who's never done it before, even down to a pound. Because it's just simply the, um, you know, there's just the physical attributes of, of the two different sexes and require different weights. And bear in mind that a lot of the work that I like to do is the arms have to be straightened out so they're not bent arms. So Indian club swinging, to my mind, is open arm and closed arm. Closed arm being bent at the elbow, open arm being a straight arm locked out. And um, with that in mind, that's why those that I would recommend those weights. I mean, historically, I mean, people like Simdi Kiho made massive clubs, up to 10 pounds each. But they are monsters to swing. I mean, they really are very, very hard to swing. And I, I went down that track. Oh, you know, got to be bigger, got to be heavier. And um, I found myself so restricted in the, in the type of style of swinging that I could do that I've gone all the way back now to two pounds is my favorite. Two and a half pounds is basically the club that I use most of the day, most of the time. From my size, I'm five foot eight, two and a half pounds is perfect for me. And after a 10 minute swing of that, boy, do you know it. You right. Know? Yeah. Um, do you want to uh, touch on um, perhaps some some more of the benefits, and then also uh, in terms of like uh, rehabilitation for the for the shoulder? Sure. Um, okay. Again, one of, we touched on this before. Some of the benefits are lifting your arms overhead, and one of the byproducts of that is. Um, that when you lift your arms over your head, your chest expands and it opens up so you can take a full breath of air. So that means that when the clubs are overhead, you're going to, um, you're, you're, you're breathing in and as you bring the clubs down by your feet crossing over the sides, you're breathing out. So it's giving you, um, basically the, the air that you're bringing into your lungs is, is pressing down on your diaphragms, pressing down on all your organs, stabilizing the core. And then you can release that air as, as the clubs are coming down and, and do it again. So, I mean, you're doing, if you think about it, you're, if you're swinging clubs, let's say you're doing 60 circles a minute, right? So, I mean, basically, that's the, the, the way I count it. So, and I, I usually do my workouts on 60 beats per minute, and that's equal 60 circles. And just for clarity, that is not, for instance, like movement one, when movement one is two circles, then you would do 30 movement ones or as opposed to 30, 60 circles. So I mean, just, to, just for clarity's point of view. Um, the, um, and so it's, and this is one of the things that the Victorians um, prescribed and the doctors did in those days was the fact that it encouraged deep breathing, which I think is really very, very important. Um, now, the second secondary thing, what happens is when you lift your arms overhead, and you're starting to drop the club. As you can imagine, the club is dropping to the side here, and it's um, on an open arm. And as the, the gravity is pulling it down, it's stretching out all the connective tissue. And that's I'm, I'm talking about fingers, wrist, elbow, shoulder. So all that, that tissue is moving, including the, sort of the muscles, and it's being pulled out. And then it's retracting, basically, on the upswing. Um, you're putting pressure into the club, getting it up again, and then down on the other side. So you've got this continuous flow of the connective tissue being almost like massaged throughout. And that includes the shoulder girdle. So from a point of view of, of um, freedom of movement, the um, and I think this is beneficial to anybody who, for instance, say pitches a ball in a, in a baseball game or a basketballer or anybody who you know, basically gets their arms up even to a golfer to a certain degree. When you swing the club down, you have to harness that, um, the, the, um, the swing of the club and then to get the upswing on the other side. And that's making the shoulder girdle move through its whole range of movement. Um, and I think that, that that's for a huge benefit for anybody who tries to start um, basically picking up Indian clubs. 
So you're working your fingers, your wrists, your elbow, I mean, the, the, the whole caboodle, basically. <laughs> so it's like joint mobility. Um, so, you know, shoulder girdle, efficiency and stability. Um, the coordination aspect is, um, is huge for this, where, um, you, you know, you're crossing over, for instance, the, um, and the discipline that I like to follow is that the right has to cross over the left, and the next time round, the left crosses over the right. So you have to think, think what you're doing. Um, so elbow and wrist we've touched on um, enhances range of motion. I mean, there's no question about that, especially with the sort of the, the heavy power lifters that I've um, had occasion to work with. Um, and then the um, efficient movement pat patterning. So we're working on the frontal plane and also the sagittal plane. And in between the two, for instance, you can swing the clubs together parallel that means that the upper body has to turn, like I was talking about in the Olympics, that the, from the waist upwards, the body turns, so you've got the transverse turn. So the movement of the spine that comes into play here. So, you again, you're working on the three, three planes, frontal, sagittal, and transverse, because you're turning your body from side to side, depending on the swing pattern that you're making at the time. So obviously, it's not a good idea. Some people will just basically learn the basics and they'll happily continue with that. My um, concept on that is, is I just love to experiment. So if just for example's sake, if I make a mistake, I will go through it and analyze it. And go, it's great if I catch it on video, but if I don't, then I think, okay, what did I do? Why did it go wrong? Um, and can I learn anything out of that? So I try to develop um, the, uh, the mistakes, I, um, you know, and just learn from them, basically. So it's another kind of ever, you know, Indian Club University. You just keep, keep learning from, you know, everything that you do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, oh, probably one of the most important topics here is, um, you know, the, these have, all these modalities that, that we spoke about uh, this evening, they've been around for, for quite some time. Um, sure. What what can we do? Um, and you've been a big part of this with with all the material and content that you've you've put out and, and your seminars and workshops. What can we do as we move forward to make sure that you know this restorative practice, um, its roots and its traditions are still going strong as time goes forward? Well, okay, that's a really interesting question. I mean, I, I personally, I've developed an absolute love and obsession with Indian club swinging, and that that's across all four disciplines. And um, and as you've said, I mean, I've put it up on YouTube, I've got it on the website, and so on. So, uh, and I have a lot of um, people following um, the videos that I put up now, and a lot of um, people are learning from them, and you know, finding their own way without necessarily going to workshops. I mean, you can find your own way. Your workshop's going to give you leaps and bounds in, in, in advancing your technique, but you can do it on your own. I did, to start off with. So to progress forward, I think, I think people generally are realizing, um, and there's sort of like, you know, there are markers. I mean, there's on the media, there's constant stuff about, you know, there was just something recently here about kids um, on their phones at night you know, ruining their sleep because they're, you know, tapping away on their phones and stuff. And like the adult population is becoming more and more aware of the fact that we've all got to move. And, and you know, basically just just take a break in the day and go walk somewhere rather than catch a bus, catch a taxi and stuff. And I think this sort of awareness that's becoming greater and greater is, is going to help. Um, and so people are looking for things to do. And Indian club work in particular is something that people seem to relate to because it's not really that difficult. The basic movements are not that difficult. You can pick them up and swing them. Clubs are not difficult to transport. You can have them in the boot of your car. You know, you can have them in your office. Um, I have my computer set here with a, a clock that tells me on the hour, every hour. And usually every two hours, I'll get up and I'll swing for about four minutes. And it's amazing how... Um, it just gets the blood flow going back into your head. You can actually feel a little bit of a buzz from it. Yeah. So, you know, and it's just that little bit of movement. And I think that people are starting to realize that. And uh, I've got um, 
there are people who are a lot older than me. I mean, I, you know, the, the um, people in the sort of you know, late 70s still swinging clubs. There's a wonderful guy called Harry Alec in the UK who's done a few videos. He's taught some of the seminars that I've taught at. And I mean, he was he's one of the old school guys. I mean, he learned as a kid. He's been doing it all his life. And, he, and you know, to watch him, it's it's like, you know, it's like silk. Honestly, it's just amazing. But I mean, from from his point of view, um, he's he's always keen to talk about it and teach. And I mean, that is starting to filter through these old methods. I mean, uh, Pavel came out with, the, you know, his um, Enter the Kettlebell book. And that's an old method. And here we've got books. And, and unfortunately, with Indian clubs, I will say one thing. The old books are really, really hard to understand and read. And some of the diagrams, when you first look at them, you think, oh, my God, what are they talking about? But now, 10 years later, I'm actually starting to understand them because I think that those books were written in those days for people who already had some form of an understanding, who wanted, might have wanted to take their Indian club swing further. Sure. Do you know? Do you see what I mean? So I mean, there's the, and so consequently, there was already those elements there. From my point of view, when I first started reading them as a beginner, it was just like God. You know, it's like, you look at the pictures now. I can't do that one. On to the next one. You know, and right, right. you finally find your way. But I think I think there is a general movement of people starting to realize you've got to get off your bum. You know, you've got to eat the right food, and you've got to do some movement. It doesn't have to be Herculean sort of. You know. Fit, uh, you know, strength feats, but just some movement would be really, really good. Fantastic. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Absolutely. Um, I think we've, we've touched on everything we had down. Uh, is, there, yeah. is there anything else that you would like to touch on before we move into the, the rapid fire questions? <laughs> rapid fire. Okay. No, I think we've gone through this. We've given you a bit, a bit of background on history, and which is, I mean, always interesting to uh, to do. And my, my personal background and how I got into it. I mean, it's um, yeah. No, I think we've covered everything. Fantastic, excellent. All right, so we're gonna do the next, the the last part that I do with with each guest. Uh, sure. It's a series of rapid fire questions. So I okay. ask uh, each guest the same set of questions, but these are. Okay. Not related to any topics we've covered. They're just uh, for you um, or for the audience to get to know you a little bit better. Sure. So they're sure, just okay. some, some good old-fashioned fun. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, Paul, first question. Uh, given all your uh, experiences throughout your life and all the knowledge that you've accumulated, if you go back in time, what advice would you give yourself 20 years ago? Oh God, I'd have loved to have found clubs a lot earlier than I did. Than I did, you know, I found them when I was fifty-six, going fifty-seven, and um, I'd have said, you know, have a look at Indian clubs because they're really good fun. I think I'd have told myself that even earlier than that, quite honestly. Fantastic. Um, mm. If you had to pick one uh, exercise, what's your favorite strength training exercise? Okay, I'm, this is like a kind of double-barreled question for me. Sure. Because um, from from a um, from a strength training point of view, I um, I I think the meals have got to be one of the best exercises, and that's using two meals, swinging them one after the other, and um, just for instance, a ten-minute session with a pair of eight-kilo meals, one on each hand, is something that I would consider my favorite strength exercise. But as far as Indian clubs are concerned, I would say a 10-minute window of swinging um, the more difficult patterns is also, um, you know, a very great favorite of mine too. Excellent. So, I mean, that's 10 minutes nonstop. You know, there's no, no, there's no pausing, no nothing during that time. Yeah. Right. Um, how, how has your training changed today compared to 10 years ago when you first started? Well, 10, 10 years ago, I was basically push biking and swimming, then sort of kettle, discovered kettlebells, and then it's gone from the kettlebells um, to um, a little bit on club bells and then mace and all those other things, all the swinging stuff. I mean, I think I've got to say out of all of this that swinging anything is a great favorite of mine. So, I mean, even though it's, it's – um, so anything that I can pick up and swing around is this is what I want to do, yeah. So it's, it's a progression from sort of, you know, push bike and swimming and then to swinging stuff. Right, 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 right. Um, 
Have you ever had an injury? And if so, how did that injury affect your training? The, and I did have an injury once with, in fact, I had two um, injuries. One, when I first started um, swinging clubs, I was um, learning how to do a back circle with my 26 inch first clubs that I ever had. And as the club was coming down at the side of my body, I was going to put it behind my back and I realized that my arm was too far forward and the club went into my ankle, which, uh, which caused a massive blood blister that had to be cauterized. But basically the recovery from that was quite straightforward. The second one was a bit worse. Um, I did a fairly extensive, about 40 minutes of um, swinging meals. And then I decided to finish it off with a pair of 10 kilo meals that I've got here. And I was tired. I knew that I was tired, but I thought I'll just do a minute because my, my challenge is anything I swing has got to be in, in increments of a minute. And um, I didn't turn enough to swing the meal properly. And it kind of, it collapsed on me on my left side and it tore a ligament on my left shoulder. Mm. It took me with Indian clubs about nine months to um, repair that. I can still feel it to this day, but it's, it's so much better than it was. I mean, it was very painful and very uncomfortable, and it restricted training a lot. I mean, that, that would have happened maybe three years ago. Wow. Um, well, I'm glad to hear that, that the clubs uh, helped no. uh, expedite the recovery. No, they did. They did, yeah, surprisingly. You know, I'd forgotten about that. No, the, 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 um, the, the Indian club swinging actually helped repair that. And then, of course, I, I, I went down to – Three kilo meals, and I started and I worked, started progressively working my way up, um, and just lightweight, but keeping the movements up. And they used to hurt a bit, and then I'd stop because you know, listen to your body is a great favorite, you know, favorite of mine. So, um, and I gradually worked my way back up. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, what's one um, thing that junior athletes, so like high school, we'll say anybody between fourteen and eighteen. Uh, which, what's one thing junior athletes should be doing more of to complement their training and their health? Well, eating, eat, as far as health is, is concerned, I mean, eating properly is, is really, really important. Resting is, a, is another, you know, get the r right rest and leave your mobile phone in the kitchen. And, um, sorry, what was the first part of the question? I've missed, I've missed something here. Uh, what's one thing that junior athletes... Recommend should be doing more of the complement their training yeah. and their health. I, I personally, I think, I mean, it's, I would suggest if they don't have Indian clubs, I would, I would recommend that they just, you know, find a bar somewhere and they just hang off of it slightly just to stretch their shoulders out. You know, so I mean, the, just that type of movement, I think it's very important because basically, I mean, that's just from what I've seen from my workshops. I mean, you know, the older people get that they can't get their arms up in the air. I mean, reaching off shelves and then, the, you know, the, the, in older still, the, there's pain associated with reaching up for stuff and so on. So, I mean, I would say work on the shoulder girdle basically to, you know, to keep that moving and keep it lubricated and working. And if they can do it with Indian clubs, all the better. Absolutely. Uh -huh. Yeah. What's your best tip to improve recovery after a training session? To improve recovery? Um, to my way of thinking is to uh, swing some very lightweight clubs, maybe like a pound or something like that, mm -hmm. to just to sort of, you know, move through. And even um, without clubs, you can do the same sort of thing, just literally moving your arms um, and elbows in, in the formation of Indian club swings, basically. That, um, that really helps. It just keeps the blood flowing and um, it just, you know, it's um, getting back into resting mode, if you like. Excellent. Uh, we got just a couple more. Um, okay. What's your favorite meal? My favorite meal? God, that's changed um, a lot because, uh, because of my um, prostate cancer diagnosis. My diet has completely changed now and it's gone to vegetables and um Funnily enough, I mean, I've always eaten that type of thing, but it's gone um, almost to a point of extreme where it's, it's all um, greens, um, very little, anything that contains sugar, I can't really eat because apparently the sugar feeds cancer. So, I mean, I've got to be very aware of that. So, um, yeah, I mean, vegetables, basically, I've got to say anything vegetable that hasn't got any sort of form of sugar in it is what I'm eating now, and that's my favorite. I mean, I, I, I'm moving with the times here because... 
if you'd have asked me maybe six, seven months ago, I'd have probably told you something different. Eat your veggies. That's it. That's, that's it. Eat, eat your veggies and um, try and you know to start it juicing and sort of you know lots of greens and stuff. So I mean, and I really enjoy it. So that's good. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, what's one book that everyone should read? This is going to sound probably really strange, but I think the discipline that I learned from Enter the Kettlebell is it's an awesome book because it teaches you discipline. I mean, you know, and how to sort of put things together. So I would say, even if you're starting, wanting to start with clubs or any form, enter the kettlebell has got to be a stepping stone for you in the right direction. So I mean, I'd recommend that to anybody. And, you know, and, and the fact that it gives you a sort of little bit of history and that discipline is just brilliant. And, and I, you know, I first started reading that 10 years ago and I still refer to the book now. And I mean, you know, for instance, where... Pavel has um, talked about doing five reps of something. The five reps in Indian clubs relates to five minutes of Indian clubs. So I've actually changed and reassigned certain things in that book. And I still follow that format to this day. So, I mean, I, that's my recommendation. You know, get your head around into the kettlebell and um, you're on a really good path. Because, because I, I can't, I can't. In all honesty, I would love to recommend um, an Indian club book, and you, and I've, as we said before, they're so difficult to understand, mm -hmm. and in many cases they were written for uh, already people who could swing clubs in their day. If you know nothing about it, basically don't waste your time. And and, I, and, say, and in saying that, I have a, um, in a, a, in a second website called Indian Clubs Academy where I've got a sort of free little seven video course just to give people the basics. Mm -hmm. So that's worth more doing that than trying to read an Indian club book. Right. That's the only reason I said that. So the book recommendation is definitely Pavel's Enter the Kettlebell. Awesome. Final question. Um, okay. Who have you studied or do you continue to study in your career to improve and get better? Ooh. Who have I studied? I, do, I like, I like um, okay, YouTube comes into it a lot here because I, I, do, I don't think I can sort of name one person basically because I, I um, especially when I'm looking at Indian club swinging and that relates to mace and meals is you watch the people who can do it really, really well and you learn from them. But you also watch the people that do it badly and it makes me want to really analyze because that, from that point of view, from my um, uh, seminars, I can then take out the bits. And in, in many cases, I can actually sort out how do you fix that? How do you repair that in somebody who's just about to learn or they're doing the same mistake? And, I, and over the years, I've actually found that to be a really good resource. I mean, I, I, I actively look for people and I would never I would never slag them off. I mean, I've had a couple of little fits on on. YouTube about mace swinging and stuff just recently, but basically I will never name anybody. I will just look at what they're doing and I'll try to learn from them because very often I might have a student in a, in a class who is doing exactly something that an, um, a beginner is doing on the YouTube. And I've actually seen that and looked at it and think, okay, well, that's how I'm going to get them to move to get around this sort of type of issue that they have. And it, sometimes it can be down to grip. Sometimes it can be down to incorrect movement of the elbow in a backswing. Sometimes it can be the fact that they're holding their clubs too low in front of the body, whereas they should have their biceps high and level with the ground in most cases. And it's little tweaks like that, and I, I find them really interesting. So I'm always looking for, um, you know, ideas of, um, you know, how if they're doing it wrong, why are they doing it wrong? What's what's the problem? And then I like looking at the guys who are doing it well. And I mean, there's a lot, there's many out there, especially with the uh, meal swinging. The guys in um, Iran do it fantastically well. The locals in India and in Varanasi swing maces like you wouldn't believe how well they do it. They do it. I mean, it seems, it looks like they've been doing it forever and a day. And I will say that those, even in both in Iran or the old Persia and in India, it's a lifetime's achievement what those guys do. It's not a sort of five minute wonder. You know, and I, you know, after my 10 years involvement with this, 
um, I feel still very much like a beginner compared to some of those guys because their their intricacies. And I think I can compare it to um, if you watch sort of Ivan Denisov, you know, the kettlebell lifter. Mm-hmm. His technique, I mean, they, that that movement has to be done spot on every time. Well, these guys in India and in Iran are exactly the same. I mean, they they have those movements down pat. I mean, they, the the motor skills that they've got are just amazing. Yeah, that's incredible yeah, to think about the uh, precision and accuracy. Yeah, and it's and it's an integral part of um, of swinging anything, regardless of whether it's a mace um, meal or an Indian club. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, well, Paul, this has been a real treat. I've had so much fun uh, taking the time to speak with you, and I've learned a ton. Um, so I'll be definitely going back through and, and listening to this because I've been a sponge over the last uh, just under two hours now. So, Oh, goodness. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's great. Yeah. No, it's great. Um, so thank you so much for, for taking the time to come on and sharing your, your expertise and knowledge uh, with everyone. No, no problems. It was a pleasure to talk about it. I always love talking about club swing. So that's really cool. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just hang on the line. Let me, uh, I'll, I'll get off the air and then I'll give you a proper goodbye off air. Okay. I hope you enjoyed this brand new episode of the Leo Training Podcast. If you value this content, please take a moment of your time, head on over to iTunes and drop in a five-star review. Or even better, share it on your favorite social media networks such as Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, or Instagram. It really helps the show to grow and reach new audiences. In the coming weeks, I'll be adding a resources section to my website. Until that new section is up, here are a couple of resources I wanted to encourage you to check out. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Strong First, as I am an instructor for them. So they have a curriculum that includes the barbell, kettlebell, and body weight. If you're interested in unconventional training, um, you can check out cavemantraining.com. There's a a lot of great content up there and some excellent instructors such as Joe Daniels, Taco Flore, and Kelly Manzoni. If you're interested in Indian clubs, I would encourage you to check out Paul Terrace Volkovinsky's website, indianclubs.com.au. And finally, if you are somebody that's dealing with low back pain, or has had a low back injury, I highly recommend and encourage you to check out any of Stuart McGill's work, as well as his website, backfitpro.com. Keep an eye out for that new page and section on my website in the coming weeks. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Leo Training Podcast. Subscribe and get even more expert training tips at www.leotraining.io.